Aloha, and welcome to this presentation of the Vegan Society of Hawaii. We're delighted today to welcome Richard Schmidt, MD. His talk today is called The Power of a Whole Food Plant-Based Diet in Optimizing Hormonal Balance, Fertility, and General Health. I'd like to now give a warm welcome to Dr. Richard Schmidt. Aloha. Thank you, Lorraine. It's, uh, it's great to be speaking to the society. Optimizing fertility health. There are countless studies that go through the benefits of optimal weight and optimal nutrition. There's too numerous to count, but the biggest part of what we're doing in our current diet with fertility is focusing on unfortunately, supplements and thinking that the supplements are the answer to fertility health. There's an endless supply of supplements that I get from my patients when they come in and they've heard on the internet, they bring in a plastic bag with 15, 20, 25 bottles of supplements. I pretty much tell them to, to empty the cabinet and start to redo the refrigerator. I ask all of my patients at the initial consultation that they consider two things for their diet that they focus on having at least 10 servings of fruits and vegetables per day. And that for my male patients, they have 37 grams of fiber and my female patients have 25 grams of fiber. This is an absolute minimum for them. And I explain to them, they don't have to worry about anything else in their diet. If they can meet these two criteria, they will be eating healthy and they will maximize their fertility health. And so it's, it's, it's easier than telling them what they cannot have. If I just tell them what they can, it's a better received. And they, they end up following it for the most part. This is based on what I went through several years ago, starting as early as 2016, when I came to whole food plant-based from the health standpoint. I was really struggling in 2016 with intractable gout. It was a familial thing. My dad had it. My uncles had it. I just felt like it was going to be my, my diagnosis for life. And so I just got on the medications, allopurinol. I maxed out the dose. I had colchicine, which is a medication to relieve an active gout attack. I had it in my car, in my office, at home. So I had tablets everywhere. That's how frequently I was getting attacks. Um, it was literally, I couldn't go six weeks without a severe attack. I just got to the point where I said, I have to do something different. I just can't stay on this path. And so I decided that I would follow an anti-inflammatory diet, which coincidentally is really a whole food plant-based diet, but that, that was my door to get in that path. And so I started, I said, let me cold turkey this. I, except for eggs, I cold turkeyed everything in my diet that was from animals within four weeks. I had not had a single gout attack. And I said, well, there could be something to this. And so I stayed, I was really excited. I stayed on it. At eight weeks, I hadn't had a single attack. I said, this is crazy. At 12 weeks, I started to wean off the medication. And by 16 weeks, I was off of all my medication and have never had a gout attack again. And I have spread this word to my patients that come in coincidentally with, you know, infertility and gout. They're inflammatory diseases, and they have had similar success stories. It's all anecdotal, but I decided that I really wanted to get more information, and I'll talk about that later, but there's no question that there's a component of this gout that is related to the inflammatory component, and it's not so much the purines, because you can have many vegetable foods and whole food in the whole food plant-based diet that are loaded with purines, but We'll talk about how that does not really affect the gout situation. So that, that got me on board. I was absolutely on board at that point. So now having this newfound lease on life without having this attack all the time, I was kind of really ready to start learning more about this nutrition concept. And so what I did is I started to read everything possible and do the educational process to become um, a food for life instructor through physicians committee for responsible medicine and just get as much information behind me so i could really be educated about nutrition any type of nutrition but really specifically the whole food plant-based in the process i 
was alleviated by two of my other biggest medical issues. I had asthma since the early 90s after a surgery that I had on my, my lungs after a snowboarding injury. And that asthma was related to a loss of diaphragmatic function. And so I just was living on Advair and I would take albuterol as needed for the severe um, asthma attacks. And I realized that after six months on this diet, and so this is after the gout, you know, kind of epiphany, I wasn't having any more asthma attacks. And so I slowly weaned off of my medication there. And I've been off of the medications for almost as long as I've been off of the gout medications. The biggest boon for me was when I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. It was in the context of having gastrointestinal infection that, that really kind of messed up my gut. And it was at a time that I was also currently being diagnosed with celiac disease. And so the combination of the two really set me back. Even though I was really good with my whole food plant-based diet, I was having a lot of probably gluten-laden foods because we were catering a lot of foods for, I have a, a vineyard and a winery, and I was catering a lot of foods for all the workers that would help pick the grapes. And I was eating a lot of foods that probably had a, lot, a fair amount of gluten in it. I went through a six month period of dropping from 180 pounds down to about 145 pounds, became severely anemic, was diagnosed with Crohn's. I had ulcers through the, the top of my small intestines all the way through my large bowel. I was told that there's no chance of getting better unless I go on the biologics Remicade. I was really wanting to fight this. And so I decided that I was going to go completely cold turkey and have absolutely nothing that was processed. That eliminated pretty much all food except fruits and vegetables. And I did that just for six weeks. And I started to gain weight. My blood parameters improved. My gastrointestinal doc said, no way, you can't not go on these medications. And I said, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to keep this diet. I'm not going to go on the medications. And then six weeks later, he repeated my upper and lower uh, GI to look for the ulcers. And it was completely clear, completely clear, no medication. And so since then, I've added back some whole grains and processed food like brown rice and whatnot, but it is a very clean diet focused on whole food, plant-based. And I have had no need to go on medications and no recurrence. To not have recurrence of an inflammatory bowel disease is remarkable since it, most will have recurrence within, usually within five years at a rate of about 80%. So I am thrilled. Those are my three medical stories that really got me going to spread the word. Let's bring it back to fertility though. What we do know about fertility is that it's on the decline in the world. And we have seen a steady decline in fertility, especially over the past 80 years. Female infertility has increased by 15%, so decreased fertility. And the male story is the same. There's been an 8% increase in infertility. These don't seem like big numbers, but this is a huge number in terms of patients. I try to get my patients on the recommendation that I had mentioned that they should have that fiber load. They should have those fruits and vegetables. But in addition to that, they need to add exercise and they need to keep their urine colorless through hydration. I don't tell them to drink X number of glasses of water a day. I just want them to have colorless urine. That's an easy enough thing to do. And it allows them to meter their own water intake. And then sleep is critically important for this component as well. All of these have been shown to be huge factors in fertility health. One of the most important things that we're lacking in this country is fiber. It's so important for fertility health. The reason being is when we do not get enough fiber, the hormones that are excess in our body are processed in the liver and they're released into the upper intestines. If the bile salts are there and the right amount of fiber is there, they will bind together with that fiber and they will be released. Your body's wanting to get rid of these hormones. If we don't have enough fiber, what happens down lower in the intestines, these hormones get reabsorbed in addition to the ones that are currently being produced and we get out of hormonal balance. Simply eating enough fiber can correct many hormonal imbalances for 
patients that are struggling with infertility and also patients that are just struggling with hormonal balance in general. Just adding that fiber back in is enough to correct most ills of hormonal imbalance. And so I really push this with my patients as the number one kind of go-to for getting their, their hormones in check. Some of the other issues that we're dealing with in terms of fertility is the obesity crisis in this country is affecting, of course, men and women at a rate that is really astronomical. We're going to go over some of those numbers later, but I think the Organization for Obesity Health, or basically normal weight, they basically came up with a figure that 51% of the world's population was going to be obese or overweight by the, the year 2035. This is unbelievable in terms of what it's going to do to fertility issues, but also general health. Why does obesity affect fertility? Obesity increases the levels of estrogen. The adipose tissue can take regular hormones and turn them into usually estriol, but some form of estrogen. And that additional estrogen is enough to play some interference with the hypothalamic pituitary axis. The, there's a very orchestrated kind of movement that happens with men and women's hormones. And that orchestration is the normal menstrual cycle for women and it's sperm production for men. And when we have those higher estrogens, it immediately changes that communication system that's going on between the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and the sex organs. And so what we see with the higher estrogens is that we're not going to get that same communication. And ultimately, those increased estrogens from the, the aromatization in the adipose tissue are going to be turned into other hormones that are going to affect issues with ovulation. And when you have a problem with ovulation, you're going to get an increase in a baseline LH level, which is a type of hormone that can increase the amount of additional estrogen. And it's this vicious cycle. So obesity plays this role for a lot of patients. And it's a real crisis when you cannot get even an ovulation to take place. But on top of that, that leads to a whole other slew of ills in terms of lack of ovulation and increased estrogen and endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial cancer. And so it's a very vicious cycle when this estrogen keeps going on. Estrogen also does affect the male population. Obesity in men can lead to that same increased estrogen level. That estrogen level can cause problems with erectile dysfunction, and then it can also decrease sperm production. So obesity is the main driver behind a lot of the infertility that we have today. And of course, focusing on diets that can reduce obesity are critical. When we talk about sperm health, we're talking about straight ability for the sperm to swim, the normal morphology, and then the ability for that sperm to get inside an egg. Those three components are required for good sperm health. There was a great study that was done and it was published in the Journal of Human Reproduction and it compared a group of vegans versus non-vegans and they really wanted to examine the parameters on the sperm and were they really that different between the two groups. And these were long-term vegans and long-term non-vegans and so they have this diet for at least the three months that it would re be required to see any changes in the sperm. It takes two and a half months for the sperm to be produced. So we had at least three months or longer on this diet. And what we found is not only was the quality of the sperm better, we did see that there was a reduced amount of DNA damage. And this is critical and it leads into the whole food plant-based diet having wonderful benefits with the polyphenols and the reduced oxidative stress. And so sperm health was clearly shown to be linked to diet and the best diet initially was touted to be the Mediterranean diet, but they, when they extracted it out, they found that all the benefits of the Mediterranean diet were related to whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. There was a study, of course, by Dr. Barnard that looked at hormonal health for women. And this hormonal health was something that they wanted to see if there was any differences in patients that were on a whole food plant-based diet, they were focusing on a diet that was rich in soybeans, whole soybeans. 
And what they found with the soybeans is that there was definitely a decrease in the level of hot flashes, better physical and uh, psychosocial scores. And in addition, there was improvement in the sexual domains. So this is a really good study that was done by very reputable researcher. And we did see a huge benefit in whole food plant base with a soybean emphasis. Which brings me up to my most frustrating comment that I get, which I've had to go head to head with many oncologists about the risk of soy products and why they're recommending that my breast cancer patients do not have soy products. And literally it's a, it's a series of studies that I keep in a file right now. And as soon as I get that recommendation that a patient has been told by her oncologist that she can't have soy, I call them up. I say, I'm sending you some research. I just want to go over the research with you. I want to be sure that you can spread this information correctly to your other patients done in a very nice way. But it literally is because we did not get any, any education in med school that we are just passing on this phytoestrogen as bad because it has the name estrogen in it. Soy acts on the beta receptors in the body. There's two types of receptors. There's the alpha and the beta receptor. The alpha receptor is the one that causes proliferation. That's found in breast, liver, and uterus. And so when you increase the amount of estrogen in the or estrogen in your body, let's say from an estrogen supplement, that estrogen goes directly to the alpha receptor and it causes proliferation of that tissue. When you have soy, the phytoestrogen only binds with the beta receptor and the beta receptor is protective against it, down-regulates. It's a selective estrogen receptor modulator, so it down-regulates the ability for regular estrogen to bind to the breast tissue. So it's protective. And so when they looked at what happens with patients that are taking soy or have taken soy and then continue their soy after being diagnosed and treated for breast cancer, they saw that there was a 29% decreased death rate from recurrent breast cancer. If somebody had a drug that said that we could give you a 29% reduction in dying, we'd be all over it. And so I'm just, I'm shocked that the community is not taking on this information about how healthy soy is for this prevention. And so changing my whole world, I advise patients to eat at least three to six soy products per week in their diet, both men and women, because there's the same evidence for prostate cancer. And so it really is something that is this horrible myth that's been out there. And we just have to dispel that myth. It's, there's no truth to it. All the truth in the science supports the use of soy for decreasing breast cancer and decreasing breast cancer recurrence. In addition, with the benefits of the beta receptors being activated, we see that soy is bone protective. So we see that soy, when it binds to that beta receptor in bones, it is actually pushing the buildup of more bone. So instead of bone breakdown, we get bone buildup. Soy has so many positive functions, and I just would advise all of those that hear this, I will send you these studies so you have them in your your file ready to shoot off to anybody that has an argument that soy is bad for you, there's absolutely no evidence that it's harmful. And these studies really dispute that well. The other part of the whole food plant-based diet is the benefit that we see in circulating levels of carotenoids, vitamin C, and vitamin E. A great study that was done of the American Journal for Clinical Nutrition looked at how we could look at the number one killer, cardiovascular disease, followed by cancer and then all-cause mortality, just looking at what these higher levels could mean for patients. When they saw the vegan diets or the predominantly vegetarian diets and they saw their levels of these three items, there was no question that there was a reduction in those three areas, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and all-cause mortality. There's this kind of theory that I hope to get proved and we'll see as we go forward. And I'm actually working on a study with Dr. Neil Barnard and it's related to fertility and time to um, conception. But 
I think there's a component of these carotenoids, vitamin C and vitamin E that need to be circulating in your body at all times to get the benefit. And those that are on a whole food plant-based diet or uh, a vegan diet have the benefit of almost every meal having an infusion of these into their system. And so it's so important that your body is bathed with this. What I try to tell my patients when they're wondering about their fertility health, just say, if you could have the happiest eggs and the happiest sperm, just imagine them being bathed in this warm kind of whole food plant-based rich antioxidant media, and they're gonna produce for you the best they can. Keep in mind that the last stage of meiosis in the egg doesn't happen until the sperm gets in. So this egg is ready to divide. But if that egg doesn't have all the products to help it divide well, which are all the antioxidants, what happens is instead of the chromosomes pulling apart and getting 23 over here and 23 over here, you get 24 or 22. We get more situations of a trisomy, like a Down syndrome, trisomy 18, trisomy 13. This is so critical and they feel that the process of meiosis, they know the process of meiosis is improved with the level of antioxidants in the system. So I just get my patients on board with thinking how they can be continually bathing their gametes in these wonderful whole food plant-based products. One of my favorite studies came out, it, actually the original study came out of Yale, but this one was out of Cornell and it looked at apples because Apples have a great reputation, an apple a day, everybody buys into that, but there's a bigger reason why apples are so good. They have 5.7 milligrams of vitamin C per 100 grams. That's pretty low. That's not a lot, but you know, you eat it, you enjoy the apple, there's other health benefits, but when they looked at what happens when you have the whole apple, so the apple flesh and the apple skin there's so much activity from the skin in the form of uh, quercetin. The quercetin can modulate the vitamin C activity. And what ends up happening is that a normal apple goes from 5.7 milligrams of vitamin C activity all the way up to 1,500 milligrams of vitamin C activity, where orange is about 100. So, and everybody thinks, oh yeah, orange for your vitamin C. No, apple for your vitamin C. It's unbelievable how much we reduce everything in medicine to look for just that level. We're looking for vitamin C only. We're gonna miss the big picture that there's so many other chemicals involved in these, this apple, chemicals that we probably haven't even discovered yet. And what that is doing to the whole system in terms of antioxidant activity for vitamin C is incredible. Just look at this as a way to say, okay, we look at nutrition labels, we see what's in it, but know that when we're eating those plants, there's thousands of other components inside that plant that are gonna work with our system to increase the benefit of what's coming out of that plant. That's why I tell my patients to get rid of all their supplements because it's so one-sided just to see one tiny element in there. And that may need another five, 10, 15 components of what would be a food substance to really activate it. So why not just have the food instead? So when I was trying to come up with the articles that could support the, the that gout would be improved by whole food plant-based nutrition. I went and I just did the study on PubMed and I found if I put in a new medication like Fobuxostat and gout, there were over 800 articles that were talking about how wonderful this medication was or what this medication would do for this and that and everything. And then I wanted to see, okay, well, what would happen with gout? and plant-based nutrition as the search item. And there were four articles, simply four articles. These will not make it in because we don't see the profit when we eat pears and peas, but you're not gonna make the money. And so it, there's so much in medicine that's not being studied because it's not profitable. And so we have to take it a step back and see where we can make changes without relying on all these medications to change our health.
we can go back to food to change our health. That was something that created a huge frustration for me. And so I'm also trying to work on a study right now that deals with plant-based nutrition and um, gout subjects. It's just, it's amazing. It's not so much that the uric acid is lower in your body when you are whole food plant-based. In fact, it could even be slightly higher because foods like spinach and mushrooms and there's tons of foods that are loaded with purines, but all the other components that are in those foods keep the inflammation down. So it's felt to be more inflammation than it is actual level of uric acid. Yes, it's great to get the uric acid level lower, but some people may have a problem with overproduction. Some people may have a problem with under secretion. And so you need to get other components that would help protect against that inflammatory insert or insult that would get everything started in the joint. But if you don't have the right level of those antioxidants in your system, then the, the attack will begin. We did see that um, in a study that was out of clinical nutrition in 2020, that vegetarians had a lower risk of gout. Uric acid levels kind of were mixed between vegetarians and non-vegetarians. They really did feel that it was the antioxidant effect that was making the change. And they also felt that the higher fiber led to monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats really creating this kind of protective environment for, for gout and decreasing the inflammatory component. Like I mentioned, there are high purine plant foods, really high, but they don't seem to have the same bump compared to a meat meal. They don't seem to have the same bump in purine levels that you would get when you're gram for gram the same or milligram per milligram the same amount of purine. There's a way that the plants actually protect us in how they package this. And I see that benefit on a daily basis by eating as much plant as I ever have. I don't have any attacks. And I know what my uric acid levels are. They are high. And I work with other foods and cherries and all this stuff to try to bring it down, but I'm not getting attacks. That was my biggest kind of win. And I'll work on the uric acid later, but it is something that we want uric acid in our body. It gives us brain health. It protects against so a lot of neurodegenerative diseases, but at the same time, you don't want too much because then that could be the, a cause for gout. But fortunately in the whole food plant-based arena, it doesn't seem to do that even with the higher levels. The information on inflammatory bowel disease, both Crohn's and UC, what we're seeing is there was a trend to recommend that patients stay away from fiber and a lot of, a lot of vegetables that could really be problematic. That has been debunked. And now we're seeing slowly gastroenterologists starting to recommend the whole food plant-based diet. We do have a fair amount of studies that are coming out. We did see a study uh, done by Chiba back this year, actually it was published in um, February, where there's about 30% rate when you start these powerful biologic medications, about 30% of the patients will just fail to respond. They just have no response. But when these patients go on the biologics and the whole food plant-based diet, and they didn't do a separate arm where it was just whole food plant-based, I wish they did, but they put these patients on a whole food plant-based diet and the biologics. They had a 96 to 100% remission. The 96 was for two patients in the study that actually had an obstruction and had to go to the hospital and they were treated separately. And so when you take those two patients out, the remaining patients that were in the study on the whole food plant-based diet all had remission. It's just remarkable that we can take a medication which, which works well, but we can get it up to 100% response rate from 70%. Like I said, I wish we had an arm of this study that just looked at the whole food plant base. I think we would have seen remarkable results just with that. The benefits of the whole food plant-based diet with inflammatory bowel disease is that we get more beneficial bacteria. We're learning about the gut microbiome. There's a ton to be learned. We're only 10 years into this new kind of gut microbiome study. And it takes about 30 years for something in medicine to actually kind of really sink in and everybody be happy with what the findings are. This is just a baby right now, but this is probably going to be what starts to change the, the pendulum over to the need for the whole food plant-based diet. 
on almost every facet of our health because these bacteria are so critically important and what they're fed by is predominantly the fiber in our food, animal products, zero fiber. So it's, it's a no brainer that we need to increase the amount of fiber in our diet. The only way to do that is with plants. The only way to do that. This is something that I think we're going to see, you know, working to our favor in medicine as people will begin to accept the whole food plant base because of this gut microbiome research. But I still want to preempt that and try to get people over there even before this information comes out. So I have pretty persuasive personality when it comes to my patients, when it comes to my family, when it comes to even my, my customers at the winery. We will really promote whole food plant based. We actually have a no animal zone at the winery where we no animal food is allowed to be served on the property. And so we're really strict about that. Three of my kids are completely whole food plant-based and they have felt incredible since changing. And that's over the past four to five years that they have. One of my kids that actually is, she played um, soccer at Stanford and she noticed immediately after fully switching over that she had so much more energy and was just a different athlete after switching. I have extended family that I've convinced 13 of them to go whole food plant-based and that number is growing. I'm over 70 patients in that have gone whole food plant-based customers at the winery, at least 15. We do multiple uh, presentations on the benefits of different types of food groups in preventing cancer, heart disease, rheumatoid disease. And so slowly I'm getting more and more of the community and casual acquaintances. I mean, don't sit next to me on the plane because you're going to hear about it. First, the airline will hear about it if there isn't an option for a vegan or a whole food plant-based, but then anybody that sits next to me will hear about it as well. I'm really concerned about that figure that I told you earlier, that 51% of the world's population will be overweight or obese by 2035. There's projection that one in three Americans will have diabetes by 2050. And this is up from one in 10 today. This is astronomical. Obesity increases the risk for 13 types of cancer, most of them major cancers. And then it dramatically increases the risk of coronary vascular disease and rheumatoid arthritis. I, I really feel we need to take action. We all can do something. We have to change what our future is going to be. We don't need to be down on that scale of one in 10 Americans that get enough fruits and vegetables a day. That's deplorable. That's, I mean, nobody in this crowd, but we have to spread the word. 73% of the food in the United States is ultra processed. We are reversing our lifespan expectancies, but we need to focus on health span, not lifespan. You can live a certain amount of time, but if you're not living in those quality years, that's going to be a burden to family, to friends, and to you. So what I tell my kids, tell my friends that are whole food plant-based, just do something to change your corner of the world. What can you do? Every time I go into a restaurant, if there's not a vegan option, I ask for the manager. And I say, you know, this is not an inclusive restaurant. I would love to sit down and, you know, kind of enjoy your food here and enjoy this restaurant and come back. But you need to add an item to your menu or you need to change this menu because it needs to be inclusive for me. It needs to be inclusive for a growing percentage of the population, much more in the millennials, um, the Gen Zs, they're really taking on the whole food plant-based movement, but we need to make a statement and everybody can make a statement. If they hear it enough, we will see the change. I'm very big about eating apples and oranges and fruits in public. When I'm walking around, I just think you have to set an example. So why not set an example with the most people seeing you? So I'm, you know, it's something that I am passionate about. I have a whole stash of apples in my car. I'm eating it as I go into the grocery, as I go, you know, to, if I go to the post office, I rarely go anymore, but there's any place I go, I'm always eating something healthy. And, you know, it's just, it's just somebody seeing you do that. That could be different. 
I think the most powerful way is to get an omnivore friend and have them over for a whole food plant-based meal. Um, they're so easy to make. If anybody has an Instapot, you can make almost anything that's absolutely delicious, whole food plant-based. And I'll share my recipes, but just having them over and just mentioning the benefits of one thing, maybe fiber, maybe, you know, what tomatoes can do with lycopene, maybe, you know, just adding a little bit of knowledge to just kind of make them think a little. And I always spread the word on Instagram. I take my plant power doc and I'm putting in information about little nutritional tips. I do it on my, my winery website because we're so whole food plant-based at the winery. And so I just really want that information to be shared multiple times over and over again. And I think it is a crisis call to action. Looking at the health of this country, we have to make change. Looking at the planet, we have to make change. And of course, just animals. We need to respect every life. And so it's it's something that I think we're gaining momentum, but every little kind of push that we do may make that tipping point happen. And we could actually make this happen faster. And so I'm I'm just passionate on in all areas, medicine, outside of medicine athletic health, just anywhere that I can spread the word, I am, I'm doing that. And I just encourage everybody that is concerned about their health, is concerned about the planet, is concerned about animals, to push your agenda in your corner of the world and try to make a difference. It only takes one person changing to become a vegan or even have just one vegan meal to start to dramatically reduce the carbon footprint. It's Every little bit helps. I just have very much enjoyed seeing my friends and family's health improve. And I think it's something that we can really say we can make a change one person at a time. I have a couple hacks for, for my patients that are really looking for weight loss. A lot of them like potatoes. They really like potatoes. And so there's this bad rap for potatoes that they get because the glycemic index is so high, it's in the 70s. And so a high glycemic food is really, and 70 is high, but you want to get it down, you know, less than 60, preferably even less than 50. And if you take the potato and you cook it and you just put it in the refrigerator, then you reheat it later, you've lowered the glycemic index almost to the level of a sweet potato. So you've taken it down into the, you know, lowered it by 40%. So it's just unbelievable little things that you can do to make foods slightly more healthy. For every one of my patients that's looking to lose weight, I tell them to have 16 ounces of water before any time they're thinking of having something in a solid food form. Just get that water in your system. It's been shown again and again to decrease the total caloric intake and you know, satiation happens much faster. So I, I push the water on my patients. I, I bring lemons to my office. I have seven lemon trees. I bring them to my office all the time. I have my patients you know, say, well, what are all the lemons for? I'm like, for your health, squeeze it on every dish you can. Just lemons, vinegar, anything that has that acidic component, not only ironically makes your body more basic, the most basic food is actually a lemon. And it seems ironic because it's all acid, but the way your body processes it turns your blood into a very base centered pH. So it's a constant drive. And if you look at the acid base balance in your body, if you can push it with foods that are constantly in the realm of making you more basic, your urine turns basic. And when your urine's basic, your body is happy because it's getting rid of all this acid that is causing inflammation. And your pH doesn't change in your blood that much, 7.35 to 7.45, it's very stable, but your urine pH changes tremendously. And so if you can add foods to get that urine pH higher, and everybody's different, you're not gonna be able to get it that high in some patients because of genetics, but there's no question that adding something like lemon juice or vinegar to any meal is gonna increase the nutritional value and decrease the inflammation of that meal. And then just eating more when you eat foods that are nutritionally dense, but not calorically dense, you're gonna, you're gonna be happier. You're not gonna be restricted. 
there's no restriction of a diet that's truly whole food plant-based. It's literally impossible to gain weight if you're sticking to that whole food plant-based, low fat diet, you won't gain weight. You'll find your happy weight and that weight will stay with you. It's, it's just such a great way to eat food because it takes so much whole food, plant-based food to fill you up that you're going to be full, no questions asked. If as long as you're not eating the ultra processed stuff, this is going to be something that will, will keep you healthy forever. That's about all I have on my lecture. I'm so happy to share anything with patients, my recipes, my studies that I use for my patients, but it's just something that I, I just would love for all of us to, you know, once a week, think about doing one of these and making a change in our, in our own little community and trying to make a change in the world. Well, it looks like we have time for some Q and A. Um, for the stomach acid, you know, they sometimes tell you don't drink water with your meal. So um, how much ahead of the meal do you advise drinking that 16 ounces of water? Uh, at least 30 minutes before. And it's better to, to have a room temperature water um, because it will absorb faster. Um, there's no doubt that if you get it a little bit more up to temperature and it doesn't have to be body temperature, but you get it up to temperature, it will absorb faster and it'll, it'll make you feel that kind of satiety a lot earlier. Thank you. I'd like to take a little extra time. Mm -hmm. I have three questions. If you don't mind, maybe quick yes or no answers. Sure. Um, I agree totally with your, uh, soy, uh, take, but what about the soy protein isolates? I tell people, go to the whole bean, not the protein powder isolates. Agree? I, I do agree. Um, it's, it's always better. I mean, soy is a processed product for the most part, unless you're doing edamame. Um, but yeah, to minimize that, that processing is really important to get the benefit. Yeah. And tofu is okay because it's minimally processed. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Uh -huh. And as far, I get people all the time telling me uh, that they're juicing, like celery juice or whatever. Uh, aren't you throwing away the best part, the fiber, because of the microbiome and how important that, that fiber is? There's no question you're going to get benefits from juicing. I'm, I'm thrilled if, if that's the change that somebody makes and they weren't doing anything at all, that's phenomenal. I, I will take it. But I do try to get them to blend instead of juice because the fiber is so incredible. And you are, you are throwing away a huge amount of practically 98% of the fiber when you juice. So it yeah. is something that um, I do encourage once they make that transition after juicing, then I try to get them to move into the blending instead. I always recommend uh, them reading Fiber Fueled by Dr. Will Bolsowitz. It's a great book. That's Fiber a great book. Fueled, you will be convinced how important yeah. it is. Yeah, okay. no question. One last question. Mm -hmm. You know how as, in terms of uh, alcohol, uh, your, the standard guidance is what? One, two drinks for women a week and, and two, three for men. I saw latest research that said there is no safe amount of alcohol that is safe. What do you think of that? It's true. I mean, alcohol is a carcinogen. There's no question. I mean, okay. you, can, you cannot deny it. Um, when you say, is there any benefit of alcohol? You start to walk on a slippery slope. And I would say that, yes, there are certain studies that would point to getting benefits from certain types of alcohol, for example, red wine, because of the potential for the polyphenols. Um, there are certain wines that are better than others, but um, you can't deny that the alcohol is a carcinogen. It's not good. I think you have to really take that in moderation and you really have to be cognizant of how much you want to have in, in your diet because it can affect multiple health systems. And so I, I encourage very light alcohol, if at all, if you enjoy it, but keep it light, very much light moderation. So, well, moderation, but light level of drinking. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. 
listen, I don't drink any alcohol at all. And I've been drinking low caffeine coffee and I'm trying to get uh, transition to a whole food plant-based diet. I'm really suffering with GERD a lot. Mm -hmm. So any, any pointers around that? Cause I'm trying to eat, you know, the rainbow and eat whole grains, but sometimes I'm thinking, boy, is this what's causing the GERD? Have you, have you done any, any kind of elimination um, diets where you, you just add back slowly and see, you know, what maybe spurs it on? Um, a lot of times with GERD, it's just, you know, trying to figure out which trigger you have, because our genetics are so different that you may actually, you know, have a trigger that, you know, other people wouldn't have. And so I usually, I like to do the elimination diets or add back. So you basically get down to a very kind of boring brown rice type mm -hmm. of meal and start with that. And then slowly add every couple of days, add other foods in. It's painful to have that same meal every time, but you may figure out that you do have a trigger, maybe not just in a certain type of food, but like a class of foods, um, whether that be nightshades or something like that, but trying to figure out which food component is causing that could really help you just kind of eject that one out of the diet and, and get that improvement. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much. I have a question about the uh, supplements. Um, do you have any, any uh, recommendation on B12 and probiotics? Um, I'm, you know, definitely B12 is something if you're going to be completely whole food plant based and um, you're not going to do any fortified foods. Um, First thing I recommend is trying nutritional yeast. Um, there, a lot of the nutritional yeast products do have B12 in them. And so that would be something, if, if that's something that you like, or you can put into your diet, you could probably get the vast majority of your B12 through that. Um, other than that, um, there are pretty reputable brands out there for just taking that B12 supplement. I don't think there's a huge difference in um, uh, the, the brand names. And for me, I actually take a, an injection because of my um, Crohn's. So I just, I, I don't absorb as well as I should. So um, I take a basic cyanocobalum uh, injection um, and that's, that works for me. But I, I would try the nutritional yeast, uh, the B12 fortified nutritional yeast. I think that's a phenomenal way to keep your B12 levels up. Okay, thank you. And the second part was about um, probiotics. Yeah. So um, I think when you're looking at probiotics, there's a lot that happens in the stomach acid once you've taken that. And so your colony units drop off dramatically when you ingest these. And so I, I really am more into the prebiotics, getting your you know best health through legumes and other I, vegetables. I just feel that that's going to give you a much better gut profile. Um, and microbiome than these these probiotic supplements. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, I um, used to like cheese a lot, and and had had real problems with it. And I um, long time ago gave it up. But I found at Down to Earth, there's a lot of uh, plant fully plant based cheese substitute products, which are very good and soy free. Have you have you found those as well? I have um, there some of these um, cheese replacement products or the plant-based ones. They're really high in coconut oil, um, and so I try to avoid those. What, the ones that are more nut-based, um, as long as you don't have nut allergies, I think are definitely a great alternative. Um, and so I'm not sure if those products are the cashew-based ones, um, but they're they're phenomenal. They're I'm really enjoying them, and I actually make my own mozzarella with with cashews and and I do a gluten-free vegan pizza and it's just phenomenal this this mozzarella it's, I friends say that they can't tell the difference between regular mozzarella and and, and mine so um yeah it's I think there's some great nut products out there really phenomenal I want to ask a follow-up then because uh, I believe what you're saying and it is delicious why are you avoiding coconut oil I need to hear more about that because I have 
use coconut oil. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of controversy on coconut oil yeah. um, over the past it, even three, two, three years. Um, it is a saturated fat. And I really believe that whether it's palm oil, co coconut oil, we need to reduce the amount of saturated fats in our diet. And so the, I don't see the benefit. And when I look at all the research studies that come from these types of saturated fat. They're so similar to animal saturated fats um, that I just, I really steer my patients away from palm oil and coconut oil products. And they're not whole foods either. Correct. As soon as you get an oil, it's not a whole food. It's a yeah. highly processed yeah. food. Thank so. you. If you ate it as a whole food, would that change it? This is very helpful hearing all this. If, if you ate coconut straight, yeah. definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I would have much more forgiveness for the whole coconut. <laughs> what do you use as a substitute for butter? I, it depends on what I'm cooking. So I will use, I have olive oil, uh, extra virgin, and I have it in a sprayer. And so it really minimizes the amount of oil that I use. Um, so, so that would be one. I try to get the more neutral olive oil if I don't want that olive oil flavor. Um, but then I will use, um, some of the, the, the fake butters occasionally. And so I have no problem using, uh, Miyoko's brand or, um, you know, some of the other, um, earthbound, uh, they, but just also in moderation, minimal amount. If there are any suggestions you might have to, or if you've seen or heard of other people who've been able to reverse their Hashimoto's or uh, be able to reduce or go off their medication. I have, um, you know, thyroid function is critical in pregnancy and we monitor the, the TSH levels and we want to always look for TPO antibodies to be sure that, you know, we're, we're not missing anything. Um, certainly the TSH levels need to be really out of whack, um, like greater than, you know, 6.5 to seven, um, to start to really have complications in terms of pregnancy loss, you know, premature, well, miscarriage that otherwise wouldn't have happened. Um, and at the other end of the spectrum, hyperthyroidism is the same problem. Um, but we do have patients and I've had a fair amount of patients that have switched over their diet when they've had Hashimoto's and they've had stabilization, not coming off of medication, but at least have been able to drop their dose quite a bit. Um, hopefully with time, I will see that they'll be able to get off their medication. Um, so there is a potential there. I mean, what is your, I mean, and, and I go back to you to say, what is your whole food plant-based diet like? I mean, is it, I mean, do you have some processed foods in there or is it really whole food? Um, I, that's the question I have for a lot of my patients that are vegan because, you know, the vegan diet necessarily is not healthy. It, it's great that you're not eating animals, but a lot of times a vegan diet can be very unhealthy because of the uh -huh. processed food. I, I happen to be one of those people that just loves, loves beans. And so I'll eat a whole can of beans um, with like quinoa or just with some hot sauce on it. Um, I just made a split pea soup the other day uh, with whole food. Sounds amazing. I mean, this sounds uh, all good. So and, do you, but I, do you I, have I, any I do, cheat foods? Yeah, yeah. I, I fall back on like maybe daily or every other day, like peanut butter and jelly on, on bread uh, for like, because if I'm doing something, I like to get back to it. I don't sometimes want to take a whole lot of time to prepare a meal or cook. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then uh, oftentimes for breakfast, I'll have either oatmeal uh, or like an almond or soy yogurt with raspberries or blueberries. Uh, so I guess peanut butter and jelly is probably the the big, big one that I, I would call the best. I mean, it's... Peanut butter, okay. Uh, jelly, eh, not so much. Um, <laughs> if it's white bread, negatory. Um, so, I mean, I don't know what type of bread you have, but you really want to, like you know. It's like a wheat bread, but it, one of the include uh, ingredients is vital wheat gluten. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if you don't have celiacs, that's, I'm, I don't think gluten okay. is bad. I think it's a great protein. 
Um, so it's, it, gluten gets a bad rap um, in general. Um, and so if you're not allergic or gluten sensitive or celiacs, you're, you're fine with that. Um, just listening to your diet and what you're saying, I'm just wondering what is that level, total level per day of fruit and vegetable serving? Um, cause what I was hearing is some, but maybe not as high as it should be. And that's where you're really going to pack your power for thyroid health is in that, that fruit and vegetable count. Um, and that 10 is a minimum number. I mean, we really should be at 13, 14, 15 servings a day. Um, that would be an ideal situation. So that would be the one suggestion and maybe it is there, but that would be the one suggestion, just hearing what you're saying. Um, and it's tough to get that many fruits and vegetables a day. It is. You have to have it everywhere. You have to have it in your <laughs> office, in your car. Then that's what I do. I, I basically have it everywhere around me. So that's my first go-to when, you know, when I'm looking for something to munch on. Yeah. I like to roast sweet potatoes ahead of time. So I have a few on hand and, um, mm -hmm. I, I do like the green smoothies with an apple, a cucumber, some spinach and awesome. Um, awesome. Yeah. The, it just do you, do, do you do a green smoothie a day not a day um i tend to drink the whole blender in a sitting which is like probably two pints and so i'll i'll be i'll take a break from it for like a week or two okay well uh, what about what about physical activity like now that it's raining a lot here in the bay area in california i haven't been getting out much for probably a couple months yeah, I, I mean, I'm so cognizant because I have the meter on of 15,000 steps a day. It, it's a goal. I, if I'm walking, you know, my, I'm going to hit 15,000 steps a day. And so I think activity plays such a huge role in inflammation and decreasing it. And when you combine it with good health, you're going to get just an believable, you know, push to your overall, not just mental, but physical and emotional well-being. And so I, I wouldn't start at 15,000 a day, I'd start at 6,000 a day, and then challenge yourself, you know, every week to bump it up by a 1000. But there's no question that just getting those steps in is I mean, it, it doesn't have to be quick steps. This is very easy walking. Does it take time? Sure, it does. It takes time to, to walk that many steps. But there's no question that the benefit you're going to get from that could be, you know, multifold. And uh, there's a real serious consideration that that could help the thyroid disease too. I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to say, yeah, thank you for taking the time and thanks everyone for, you know, adding the time for listening and that kind of thing. Well, thank, but thank you, you for asking. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Your yeah. Questions. And absolutely. Thanks for, thanks for coming to the presentation. Dr. Schmidt, it was a wonderful talk today, and we learned a lot, and I'm so glad you came, and I just want to give you a big mahalo. Thanks so much. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. Yeah.